In today's lesson, we're talking about this, the map of American English mouth posture. Now this looks messy, but don't worry. We'll be covering every point and how this affects every sound in the language. Note that this image is approximate, but it is based on research and how things feel in my mouth as a native speaker. And we're going to be talking about the settings for different parts of the vocal tract, meaning what you have to hold in place more or less at all times, regardless of what sound you're producing. Now you already do this in your native language, but you just have to adjust each setting as needed for American English. Let's very briefly talk about the jaw setting. Now the jaw needs to be open enough for us to have enough space to work with. However, keep in mind that the jaw is not the most important thing when it comes to space in the mouth, and just because your jaw is open enough does not mean that you have enough space. It's just the first step, and there are a few other things that you also have to change. Now, one thing that has a huge impact on the space in the mouth, especially back here, is the soft palate setting. Now, the soft palate, or the vellum, is that part of your mouth up in the back that will open and close to help produce nasal sounds. But here we're talking about the default height and tension settings, not what we need for a particular sound. In my experience so far exploring and teaching this, other languages seem to have some degree of a lower and or tighter soft palate. And in American English, we want it to be higher or open, not in the sense of open or close for the nose, but open in the sense that we have more space. And we want it to be relaxed. Again, not relaxed in the sense that it just hangs there, but you don't tighten it. You don't hold any tension in it. We breathe more in American English, which you probably know, but it turns out that this actually helps to lift and hold up that soft palate, and that actually might be a big part of the reason why we tend to hold it higher. Now, super quick on the throat setting. So I've talked about the throat before, so we're not gonna go into all the details here, but the throat is generally open and relaxed, especially on the top. This top area is usually what causes the problem for people learning American English. There's one bonus point I wanna mention here that I have not mentioned in any other videos, which is that you do not want to pinch the sides up here. It seems that in order to help support this sort of higher, tighter top of the throat area, which also helps maybe push the tongue forward more, they tend to pinch in from the sides. And so if you can try to not just relax and open out sort of this way, but also this way, right? See if you can sort of tighten and release, tighten and release. Now there are two ways that you can hold the tongue in the mouth, two parameters, right, or details. There's high versus low, so up and down. There's forward and back. Now, based on my own experience and what I've seen in the scientific research, American English seems to be one of the lowest and farthest back languages. And this means that the tongue is constantly held very low in the mouth, sort of like it's sinking into the jaw. And this allows us to have tons of space up above the tongue. And in addition, the whole tongue is held constantly back a bit. It's constantly pulled back. Now by constantly, of course, I mean the setting. If your language holds the tongue up here and makes all the sounds, right? Front sometimes comes up for a sound, the back sometimes comes up for a sound, that's fine. But the tongue is generally held at a higher height. English or American English does the same thing, except we hold our tongue down here. That's why we have more space regardless of what sound you're making. Now this is actually the single biggest reason why you have trouble making certain sounds, especially the schwa sound. So for the back of the tongue, the default position, the setting, of course, we want it low and back, just like the whole rest of the tongue. But don't go so far back that you block the throat. The back of the tongue is a little extra special and important because it can push the whole tongue forward or you can just have a forward tension in it. Same thing, you can sort of pull the whole tongue back or you can kind of have a backward tension in it. And we don't want that forward or backward tension necessarily. What you should feel in English, if you imagine the throat as sort of a cliff and then your tongue is sort of here on top of the cliff, you don't want the tongue to be over here, right? At the back of the tongue. Of course, it's, I mean, it comes up from the throat, but you don't want it to feel like it's over here. You want it to almost feel kind of like it's hanging off just a little bit, right? Kind of like we see in the image. Again, it's approximate. I tried to draw in a way that would make sense. But 
you don't want to block the throat. That's the big thing. Oh, oh, right. You don't want to do the sounds in the throat. You don't want to block the throat. Again, it should feel like it's sinking down and back into the jaw as it hangs off the hinge. That's going to be a very key important detail that I haven't talked about yet. We're going to see that in a second when we talk about the middle of the tongue. So the center of gravity, I've talked about that in phase, the phase one lesson and how to set that up and how that feels and what it is and blah, 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 blah. Go check that out. It's basically, uh, it's basically the schwa sound. Note that the middle of the tongue, again, is low and back. Okay, that's our default position. With the exception of R, no matter what sound you're making, this space in the middle will more or less be maintained during all of speech. When I'm speaking to you right now, if I pay attention, it feels like all the sounds that I'm making, except for the R, are sort of moving around this center point. That's the center of gravity. So if I'm doing E, I feel space here. The E does its thing. We're gonna talk about that with the front of the tongue. Even though the front is high, the middle doesn't come up too. Okay, I keep that space. If I do ooh, back comes up, I still have the space. Now the hinge, there's this hinge thing. You can probably see my door frame there, right? That's, we call that the hinge. Well, we actually have that inside the American English mouth. Hinge is there, and then you just, just like a door, it just lifts up. Uh, ta You're gonna count. One, two, three, four, five. Now this you can't really see as well on the map because it's a side view. You'd have to see it like more from the back, like looking in from the back of your head so you can maybe imagine that. The body of the tongue is low. This is low, this is low, this is low. But the sides of the tongue, particularly in the middle, the middle sides, uh -huh, are going to slightly raise. You don't wanna do this, okay, that's too much. They're gonna slightly raise. Don't worry about touching the bottom. What you're gonna do, if you imagine that there's the, say like, okay, this is the side side, right? Then this is like the bottom side, and this is like the top side. So it's like a corner almost. Now you wanna take that top corner, the top side, on both sides of your tongue, in the middle. You're gonna lift slightly, and you're trying to touch on that fifth tooth, okay? This would be the inside of your teeth, right here. This would be the bottom of the top teeth, aha, uh -huh. okay? And this is the corner. So you want the corner of, like the upper corner of your the side of your tongue to touch the upper corner of your fifth tooth. You have to have that. There are some sounds that can break that, and we're gonna see what sounds do that, but most sounds will have that hinge. If you do not have the hinge in place for most sounds in American English, they will not sound right. It is a core part of the accent. There's also something that I like to call the anchor. Now, the hinge is a concept from the scientific literature. Okay, I didn't invent that. There's also the anchor. So this is one of the, the few details that between among you know, native speakers with a neutral sounding accent from whatever place, it doesn't matter. There's a couple little details that might be a little bit different and it might slightly affect how they sound if you listen very closely, but they don't sound like they have an accent or, or anything like that. This is one of those details, perhaps. When you have the hinge, hinge is universal, it's required. But in addition to making contact with that fifth tooth, if it's easier for you, you can also make contact all the way along from the rest of the middle and even on part of the back of the tongue. Now also make sure that you're not way up high. Again, we don't wanna hold the tongue high. You also don't wanna be between the teeth. There are a couple sounds where you can kind of scoop between the teeth a little bit, but generally don't want that. So not too high, not too low. So you can contact the hinge, you can contact all the way back, either way. Now there's one thing that can sort of tie this together and give you a better visual image of what we're, we're trying to do here and help you feel this. And it's what I like to call the beanbag chair hammock. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna combine these two images if you imagine your top teeth as poles, and you imagine your tongue as kind of a cloth, you're gonna take the sides of the cloth, you're gonna tie it up onto the poles, okay, so we maintain that contact. This will apply for, you know, most sounds in general, but we're just focusing on getting that nice, good uh, center of gravity basic sound. So you lift up, you tie it to the poles. Now from there, in order to help get the right lowness and backness, you're going to imagine that you're sort of sitting into that cloth in the middle, the back middle. So the back of the tongue will actually kind of become almost like the back of the chair, okay? Because what happens when you sit in a beanbag chair, the back will kind of 
bulge to support your weight a bit, right? Okay, so you sit into that beanbag chair. Now it's also a hammock because it's suspended from the poles. So the hammock is kind of going this way, going side to side, and then it has a, a back that you're sitting into. So your, your tongue is sort of hanging off of the hinge, like I mentioned earlier, almost like it wants to go in the throat, but it doesn't quite go into the throat. And you just sit into it. Uh, not uh, or uh, not ah, uh, not ah. Uh. Gotta get right in the middle, middle back. Everything low, everything back. Uh. Now there are some sounds that will completely break the hinge. Ah. Now if I do a lazy ah, it'll probably just kind of come off a little bit or get very loose. But if I do a nice, good, clear ah, like cat. Ah, ah, ah. Again, I have my anchor, so I feel the connection here. It kind of almost like pulls off like a zipper a bit. But the hinge itself, I no longer have contact. Now when I go back, it goes right back to where it was. Now the front of the tongue, the default position, right? We know that the tongue needs to be low, it needs to be back. What does that mean for the front? Of course, it's gonna be low. If you are not using the front of the tongue for a sound, like the E or the T or whatever. So you do a K, you do an uh, whatever with the exception of maybe the R, you're gonna keep this low. There's this teeth line, uh -huh. okay? You do not wanna be above that teeth line. So you don't wanna be holding your tongue up here. You want it to just sort of sink down. Now you're not trying to push it and hold it way down here, okay? It can really be anywhere, as long as it's below the, that teeth line, it could be anywhere in here, it doesn't matter. You wanna just sort of rest there, to sort of hang out. So that's the height. Now we know everything else is low as well, but what about that backness? Now in the research, um, I did find that the, say for example, in French, they'll actually put, the, because the, the tongue is pushed forward, the front of the tongue will actually be like very firmly on here. Like they're sort of pushing into these teeth here. And I don't know if that applies to all French speakers. That's just what I found in the research. Talking to some Spanish speakers, they say that the tip of their tongue is lift, lifted and it's kind of hanging here, but it is kind of like, it's not away from the teeth. So it's still kind of really close to the teeth. So again, because Spanish is pushed forward. What English is supposed to do by default, based on the research, is you're supposed to be pulled back from the teeth. Because if the whole tongue is pulled back, then that will actually mean that you're not touching the teeth. Okay, so you should be low and back. So you should have a space here. And that's fine. If you do that, you will sound great. In my experience, as I've said in some live streams before, I can anchor the front of my tongue right here. And I'm not pushing really, really hard. I'm kind of maybe just stretching the front a little bit. Right, stretching it out a little bit because um, everything is, is low and back. I'm not trying to push it from here, right? So I'll maybe stretch a little bit to get a nice, good, solid anchor here, and I'll do e, 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 a, a. All right, I could do pretty much all vowels without moving the front of my tongue from that spot. So you don't absolutely have to have the the, the front of the tongue not touching the teeth, but if you do, you're probably going to have to stretch this a little forward because you want the rest to be down and back. So that might be a hack for you. If, um, there's different ways to approach this, whatever it is. But the simple, easy default thing that I recommend for most people to do is just to go ahead and let the whole tongue kind of come down and back. You're not touching the teeth um, and you stay low. Now, this is interesting because there's the tip of the tongue. There's the blade of the tongue. This is called the tip blade system. And this is actually very important between different postures. Okay, because the tip and blade system will sort of be lined up or used slightly differently in different languages or based on their posture. Now, what you want for English, you want that tip blade, not necessarily the tip itself, right? Not the tip going straight up, but this sort of tip blade, this front of the tongue, you should have it lined up roughly, doesn't have to be perfect, but roughly under the bump. You don't want it to be lined up here. You should be able to go straight up onto the bump. Now, if doing that, you have to do something like this, that means that you're starting too far forward because you've probably seen my lesson talking about the T where it's like, oh, do it on the bump. And then you're like, something still doesn't sound right. Well, maybe because your posture is too far forward and you have to sort of reach back for it. Again, hinge in place. So we're not like, uh, ta, no. Hinge is there. And then you just, just like a door, it just lifts up. Uh, ta, the lip settings. This is it's gonna be a little complex, but I'm gonna break this down in a way that will make a lot of sense and you can sort of categorize things. Now, our lips are front biased. What does that mean? It means two things. Number one, it means that most of the tension and movement in the lips, for whatever sounds we use the lips for, 
are going to be more from the front. So the top front, bottom front is going to be more from here. And any tension that we get that's not in the front will usually come from pushing the corners forward, usually to help support the front uh, motion, rather than squeezing down or pulling back. Many languages really seem to kind of hold, it's, it's almost like there's a crease here, right here in the, in the corners. It's like they kind of hold this, and I'm, I'm maybe exaggerating a little bit, but they hold this extra little tension sort of squeezing down. And then whatever they do, they say E, they say ah. Everything kind of operates from here, and it's more about holding tension and then pulling to bring the lips together. You do not want to do that in English. Corners are actually by default. What's the default setting? They're going to be relaxed slash open. Okay, so relaxed in the sense that we're not holding them tight. Open in the sense not that we're trying to... All right, you want it to be where... Right, we're not trying to hold it close. It's just there. Right, the corners meet and they meet. That's it. They're not holding any tension there. Now notice that this ties into everything else. If I'm open and relaxed, open and relaxed, open and relaxed, everything opens up. That includes the space here from the lips. It's like a window. If the window is more closed, things can't get through as much. Okay. So even if I just tighten the corner on my lips here and I keep everything else the same, you'll notice that I sound a little bit different. I sound a little bit weird. Like the lips can be broken into five categories or groups. We have sounds that don't use the lips at all. We have sounds that are front biased only, meaning that there's very little or no corners. We're just using the front of the lips. There are sounds that pull the corners. This is never required. There are sounds that push the corners forward. Some are required, but they are always front biased. And then there are Ow and oi, which are a special combo group. Up next, we're going to see how these settings apply to every sound in the language, which is essentially going to be our phase two for mouth posture. But let me know if you have any questions uh, down below. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully this is useful. See you in the next one.